Have you ever wanted to plug something into a network jack but there just wasn't one nearby and you didn't want to run a cable across the room? Well, I'm going to show you how to add Wi-Fi to pretty much any device, old or new. And to prove my point, I'll take on an ancient PDP-1134 mini-computer and drag it kicking and screaming into the 21st century by adding Wi-Fi. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, I'm going to build the world's worst portable computer by making my PDP-1134 completely wireless. Or would that be luggable? Or maybe a pushable? And for the sticklers in the audience, you know who you are, the ones thinking, yeah, wireless except for that big power cable, we'll fix that too. We'll fix that the right way with several hundred amp hours of lithium batteries for a solid six hours of portable PDP fun. Now, a cordless PDP-11 might be a little absurd, but at least it all started out grounded in reality. You see, while restoring this machine, I ran the serial cable that I needed to control it and the Ethernet cable that I needed to communicate with it across the shop floor. USB is only good for about 10 feet without a repeater, so I ordered a 60-foot active USB extension and a long network cable, and together they worked great. And that's fine as a temporary solution while you're working on something, but when I was done, I wanted to move it to a little corner of my shop museum where there isn't a network jack and where I can't easily run a cable without it crossing the floor in a dangerous way that I'm not comfortable with. So I not only had to remote the networking somehow, I also had to remote that DB25 serial port from the 1970s. Now, not everyone is going to need to do it for their PDP-11, but there are a lot of cases ranging from laser printers to Xbox 360s to smart TVs where you want to plug something into a LAN jack, but you don't have a port handy. You have Wi-Fi, but the device doesn't have Wi-Fi built in. So what do you do? Well, you could out a power line extender, but my experience has been pretty mixed with those, and they're generally Wi-Fi anyway. And one time it sucked, and the other time it rocked, and I don't know what the difference was. Probably different phases in the breaker box, maybe. In any event, I didn't really want to worry about stuff like that, and since I already had great Wi-Fi coverage, it made sense for me to use it. What I really needed then was a magical box with an Ethernet port on it that I could plug into the network cable and then have the box would connect to Wi-Fi and act as a silent bridge, giving the wired device a connection that was actually backed by Wi-Fi. The device would be none the wiser, because for all it knew, it was plugged directly into a wall jack or into the switch. I didn't know if anybody even made such a thing, and I wasn't sure what to call it. It's not a Wi-Fi extender, it'd be more of an Ethernet extender over Wi-Fi. So I searched on Amazon, and I found a unit that looked like it would do what I needed. It's billed as a universal Wi-Fi to Ethernet adapter with RJ45 gigabit port. Descriptive and accurate because that's precisely what it does. It takes your Wi-Fi and provides a hardwired Ethernet port that's connected to your LAN wirelessly. I ordered one, so let's take a look at what I received from Amazon. Inside the box is a black brick with two permanently attached but adjustable antennas. There's no power adapter because this unit, for better or worse, plugs directly into an outlet. That works for me, but it winds up covering other outlets, which can be a problem if you're working with a power bar or a single outlet. In that case, the hot tip is a set of these stubby extension cables, which I'll put a link to in the video description. I use them all the time for power bricks and similar setups. If you've ever filled a power strip with two power bricks, you know what I mean. Grab yourself a set now for when you inevitably need them. You also get a flat and thin network cable, which turns out to be perfect for where I need to route it inside the PDP-11. Now, you might be surprised to learn that this PDP-11 even has an Ethernet cable coming out of it at all, and rightly so, because that would be actually quite uncommon. That Ethernet cable actually belongs to the Unibone card, which is a full Linux computer running on a single PDP-11 Unibus card. Now, the Unibone can emulate and present devices ranging from memory to hard drives on the bus, but you control and modify the config by connecting to the system over SSH, and so I needed some kind of network connectivity to it. This would be all much easier if it had Wi-Fi on board, but it's built around what's known as the BeagleBone Black, which apparently is popular in Europe, but it just doesn't have Wi-Fi. To give it connectivity, then, we'll simply run an Ethernet cable from the Unibone to the new Ethernet over the Wi-Fi extender brick. Plug it into power, and once we're done configuring it, it should be entirely transparent. Now, it's key that no config is required on the device being connected. You just have to get the thing set up the box itself one time, and after that, anything you plug into it needs no configuration. Let's take a quick look at the steps required to create a Wi-Fi extender for your LAN. So once we've plugged the device into the wall, we want to find its Wi-Fi, which is called Brostrand EXT, and we're going to connect to it. That will take a few seconds, and once we connect, we are brought to its main web page. Here we want to enter a new default password, not admin. 
And now we want to scan for a network to join. There's two modes that this extender can operate in. We're going to do it in the Wi-Fi to Ethernet mode. Another option is the AP mode, where it actually acts as an access point as well. I'm also going to skip the 2.4 and go right to the 5 gigahertz band. I'll enter my password here, which I trust this offshore company will guard carefully. And we'll click Extend, and that will extend our network. Now it'll actually take about a minute and a restart, I believe, for the thing to come back up and be as a bridge. And once it does, we can ping the Unibone and we get a response back showing that it's live on our LAN now, plugged directly in with its own Ethernet cable. The LAN port seems to be a direct bridge across the Wi-Fi, meaning that you can even plug a network switch into it and the devices behind the switch get bridged as well. It seems to function just like a LAN jack for all intents and purposes. And with the Ethernet port remoted, I can now connect to the Unibone and do things like load the bootloader for the PDP-11 into memory, but I still need to connect to the serial console to actually start the machine. It's that, or head to the front panel and start entering addresses and pushing initialization buttons. So to avoid walking or running along USB or serial cable, I'm going to remote the serial port next, and then we'll move on to the battery power. Remote serial ports are even more of a specialty item than remote Ethernet ports, but we do have some options. Mercifully, most of them are under about $50, including the one I purchased, labeled as a serial to Wi-Fi Ethernet converter. It says it can do RS-232 and RS-485, but I don't really care about the latter. Inside the box, you'll find very little. Just this box with a few LEDs on it, a DB9 port, and a serial cable, and a power adapter. But that's all you'll need. One important note is that these devices are going to use a device driver to create a virtual COM port on your machine, and since a device driver is involved, they're not operating system independent. As far as I could tell, if you want to remote your serial port with one of these, you're going to have to be controlled by a Windows machine. Since the PDP-11 GUI software that I'm using also only runs on Windows, I installed it on my trusty old 3270 Threadripper. There's not a lot to say about the software. It's uh, functional. It still has buttons styled in the fashion of the 1992 Borland Turbo C, but it functions. To set it up, you run the installer package from the website and let it do its install thing. Afterward, you do the standard dance of connecting to the device's Wi-Fi and then the device's web page so you can give it the credentials that it will use to connect to your Wi-Fi. We've all done that a hundred times, and that's pretty straightforward. Once you've got the box connected to the Wi-Fi, we want to set up a virtual COM port that points to the IP address of the little serial box but it's not clear to me how you know what the IP address is when you set that up if it's got a dynamic IP. So I took the extra minute to go to my router and assign that device a static IP so I always know where to find it. You might get away with a dynamic IP or even using the host name, but you could also use the search feature in the app each time, I suppose. But I wanted to set it and forget it, so a static IP should allow me to do that. To set up the virtual COM port, we run their VCOM application that gets installed. We click on Add a COM port, and we get a dialog that allows us to specify the parameters. Now, I'll go with COM1, but you can use any unused COM port address on the machine. I entered the static IP of the little device and left the port default at 8899. If all goes well, after you click OK, the status will change over to Connected, and then any applications that use COM1 will be automatically routed to the serial box over Wi-Fi. My serial connection to the PDP-11 is a little complicated because I actually have three sources. A local VT220 terminal, the remote Wi-Fi serial port that we just set up, and then a third port that is only sometimes connected when I hardwire it via USB cable to a laptop. This switch box allows me to dial in and dynamically change what device is actually connected to the PDP-11. And that solves all of our cable connections except the biggest one of all, power. Now to make a truly cordless PDP-11, we need to... Remote the power, and since you likely don't want to hear a gas generator running in the background, that means batteries and some kind of inverter. For batteries, I wanted to get something with a reasonably portable form factor so that I could lift it and that we could be easily replaced if and when needed, so I decided to go with the car battery style of lithium battery. I selected a set of four from Seikon, running at 12.8 volts and each with a 100 amp hour of capacity. That means each battery has a hefty 1,280 watt-hours, and a set of four should be just over 5,000 watt-hours in total. Links to the batteries that I actually used can be found in the video description. Using a meter, I can see that when plugged into the wall, the PDP-11 in its current config pulls about 900 watts. The problem is that the cabinet sticker says that you could have up to 24 amps of equipment in this rack, which would work out to some 2,800 watts. Fortunately, we're nowhere near the capacity of the rack. While a 1,000-watt inverter would theoretically power our rack, I want a little headroom. 
It's also important that the inverter be able to handle a higher startup surge load because there are numerous electric motors that spin big hard drives and so on, and starting AC motors, or I guess DC motors too, can take quite a surge of current at first. I actually already had a 3500 watt inverter on hand, but it's a square wave inverter. The normal power waveform that comes out of the wall from AC power service is a perfect sine wave, and many electronics kind of depend on that. I wasn't sure how the PDP-11 would react to a square wave power signal and didn't really want to find out, so I reserved the old one to my table saw and then went looking for a nice sine wave inverter. Thanks to Amazon, your choices are legion. I wound up getting this 2000 watt pure sine wave inverter from Giandel. It's good for 17 amps of current, which should be more than enough for our actual needs as long as it can handle that startup hit. I wasn't sure, as there was no surge rating on the inverter, and even if there were, it's rarely a specific indication of how long that surge can last. The only way to find out then was to try it. My first step was to cable the batteries together in parallel. Before doing that, however, I also bought a new charger, one capable of properly handling the charging of lithium-ion phosphate batteries. I then charged each one fully, checked the voltages between each one, and they were all within a couple hundredths of a volt, which is important. Why? Well, imagine, worst case, you had one fully charged battery and one depleted battery, and then you hooked them together. What you'd then have is a direct hardwired connection where the charged battery was doing everything in its power to send current into the depleted battery. That can overload the interconnect cables and is generally a bad idea. So you want to make sure they're all in the same state of charge when you connect them together. When the bank of four batteries is connected, I next connected the bank to the inverter itself. Everything powered up as expected, and I was soon able to plug the PDP-11 into the inverter. The first thing I noticed, however, was a fault light flickering on the PDP-11 power supply, likely a grounding issue of some kind. This was even before it was turned on. And I'm not an AC power guy in any way, so I have no idea how the PDP-11 could actually tell that it's being plugged into an inverter rather than into line power, but it seemed to know. If you understand that process and why it happened, please explain it to me in the video comments because I'm curious. In any event, I cycled the breaker on the PDP and the main power on the inverter, and when they both came back up, it was without a warning light, so I figured it was time to try. I hit the power button and the machine sprang to life, fully on battery power. Now, I have to confess, a few times when I've tried to power the system up, the initial current inrush is more than the inverter can supply, or more likely, right on the ragged edge of what it's capable of, and as about one time in ten, it just starts to growl and doesn't actually boot. That uh, worries me a bit, but it didn't cause any harm the couple times that it happened. That little occasional hiccup aside, with our inverter humming away and all of our connections on Wi-Fi, we've done it. I know the oil and gas industry used to run them in the field, but... That was usually off of generator power, but we built what may be the first, or at least the only current, battery-powered PDP-11. Of course, if you have one, feel free to prove me wrong in the comments. If you found today's little adventure to be any mix of informative or entertaining, please remember I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you consider leaving me one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you! If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, The Non-Visible Part of the Autism Spectrum. It's intended for folks that likely don't have autism, but who may have some of the characteristics of being on the spectrum. It's everything I know now about living a successful life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.